Welcome back, or welcome if you're just joining us. It's the France 24 debate. Uh, right now, uh, Washington intelligence agencies in a bit of a state of limbo. A uh, provision has lapsed uh, following disagreements that continued until uh, midnight Sunday uh, in the U.S. Uh, Senate. And before a new the bill gets passed uh, right now, uh, bulk data gathering yeah. has been severely curtailed, sort of an unprecedented situation for spy agencies. Uh, with us to talk about it, Zachary Miller, producer of the uh, upcoming documentary Countermeasures Unveiling the Global Surveillance State, uh, Fabrice Eppelboin, who teaches uh, information warfare at the French Political Science Institute, Sciences Po, uh, from Syracuse, New York, former senior official at the U.S. Department of Homeland Security, uh, Nathan Sales, who teaches national security law at Syracuse University's law school, and uh, political commentator and blogger uh, Jean-Pierre uh, La Rochelle. Welcome back to all of you. Before the break, uh, Nathan Sales making the argument that uh, actually, point of fact, the NSA uh, is more regulated than uh, the Internal Revenue Service in the United States. Well, I'm not going to debate the Revenue Service, but, uh, you know, it's laughable about the FISA court. The FISA court is a rubber stamp. That's not even debatable. Uh, it's a secret court. It's You have examples of how many times they said no to the NSA, and that is very minuscule. So, I, you know, I don't even want to talk about that. I want to talk about some systems. We, we have this premise that we have to have security or privacy, but we can't have both. The fact is, uh, before 9-11, there was developed in-house a system called Thin Thread. This was developed by William Binney, a 30-year veteran of the NSA, mathematician, crypto analysis. It was developed in-house. It was ready to go. It wasn't used. Why wasn't it used? Because the director wanted an outside contractor to develop a system that was termed trailblazer. Trailblazer eventually cost over a billion dollars. It was never used. It was, it was considered a, a huge financial expensive failure. I want to know why things like that happen. You know, we have a workable system that not only got the intelligence you wanted, but it also protected U.S. citizens' privacy. Why wasn't that used? Jean-Pierre Larochon? Well, I mean, that was an internal decision, but I just wanted to add a point about this oversight, because in addition to the uh, FISA court, we also have oversight by the Senate. We have the Senate uh, Intelligence Committee that oversees these programs and has oversight, and this is ultimately uh, where the political responsibility lies. All right, and that brings us to the... Uh, to, the to Intelligence to Committee that was spied on by they the were, NSA. They were spied And, and, and yes. that Senator Ron Wyden... Uh, talked about that he couldn't want it to talk and couldn't say what he wanted to say. That's not very much of an oversight. Well, the fact that they're spied on does, doesn't impede upon their, their ability to do oversight. But I, 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 I do agree. Upon, uh, it impedes upon their, their psychological well-being if you're going to be spied on if, by if the any, people you're supposed it, to be oversight. If anything, it'll make them more critical of, of the agency that they're overseeing. N but, N could, let me bring in Nathan Sales. Nathan sure. Sales. Yes, on the question of the FISA court and whether it's a rubber stamp, I think the evidence is decidedly to the contrary. The, the FISA court is actually a very robust overseer of NSA and FBI intelligence gathering. But operations. what is it? Something like 40,000 requests and uh, I think uh, less than two dozen that have been approved over a period of decades? Yes, and uh, of those 40,000, fully 25% are sent back with the answer, not yet. The court, in other words, has concluded that the government has not put forward enough information to justify the surveillance, or the court is not convinced that the government's uh, privacy protective measures are sufficiently robust. So in fully 25% of all requests, the FISA court says, you've got to do a better job. That's exactly what you would expect an independent, neutral, detached overseer to do. And that refusal rate is roughly comparable. In fact, it may even be higher um, than the rejection rate that you see in ordinary criminal investigations. All right. Th this issue, as I was saying, resonates on this continent. Reporters now probing their own domestic intelligence gathering practices. The Guardian newspaper in Britain this Monday reporting that in the UK, where warrants from a judge are mandatory, 93% of uh, police requests to wiretap calls and browse private uh, uh, citizens are uh, br private uh, browsers are uh, granted at a pace of one uh, every two minutes. Uh, and it quotes uh, Labor MP Tom Watson, our intelligence and police services remain in danger of losing public legitimacy for the surveillance they conduct. Your reaction to that, Nathan Sales? 
Uh, 93%, um, that sounds about right, actually. Um, uh, the, 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 the reason why so many of these requests are approved is because, uh, approved by the courts, is because uh, the internal approval process that has to happen before you can even submit the request to the courts is incredibly robust. Now, I can't speak to the approval mechanisms uh, in the UK, but I can tell you that in the United States, there are multiple layers of internal review, there are multiple uh, lawyers who are in a position to say no and who do in fact say no with some regularity uh, that blocks the unmeritorious requests from even getting to the court. Um, so once the, it, a court is in a position to say yes, it's only because there are literally dozens of lawyers who reviewed it beforehand and also said yes. The bad ones get screened out before they even get to the court. Fabrice Pelbois? I think, once again, the point here is institution losing their legitimacy. Once they will have totally lost their legitimacy, what will be left of democracy? Nothing. Uh, what will happen when most of American or French citizens lose any kind of faith in their politicians? We are heading toward a very dangerous zone in terms of politics. Uh, we're heading uh, like But Spain. you heard Nathan Sales there say that uh, if 93 percent of those police wiretaps are approved in the UK, it's because there's been a screening process beforehand. Yeah, still. The, this institution is losing its legitimacy. So there is a problem to be solved here, and it's a leg legitimacy problem. It's a huge, huge, massive legitimacy problem. And this mass surveillance frenzy, frenzy is really hurting badly our democracy. So uh, we might uh, be buying some security, but we're losing democracy. All right, that's not the opinion of your prime minister. The French parliament's passed a bill supporting enhanced intelligence gathering powers, one that on Tuesday heads to the Senate. He has decided it must rally in support of this efficient, purposeful law that the French people have been waiting for. I am also glad there was a spirit of responsibility. Despite the sometimes pointless controversies, the intolerable accusations such as those which said the law would kill civil liberties, and also the pressure we saw being put on parliamentarians yesterday. And that was Manuel Valls speaking uh, after the vote in the National Assembly. It sailed through two-thirds of the French, according to uh, one survey published in the Journal du Dimanche, app approve uh, uh, of this bill. Fabrice Appelbois is the Frenchman in the room here. What do you think of checks and balances in France compared to checks and balances in the United States? Oh, I think we're very new to this game. Uh, the American people have... 15 years of experience when it comes to mass surveillance, and they have Edward Snowden. So far, we haven't have had anything like Edward Snowden in France. But hang on, it's not just Edward Snowden. The, the, there's also, as we've been talking about, there are special courts, which are more or less effective. There's uh, Jean-Pierre was mentioning the U.S. Senate panel. What, the, we what have do you, nothing what do you like think? that. We have absolutely nothing like that. We have a, a mini court, dedicated court, made of politicians who really don't understand the, the technical aspect of all this. And we have a real rush toward those surveillance technology inside the French technical ecosystem, uh, working hard on predictive technology, working hard of te on technology that are uh, designed to ensure uh, social stability, which has nothing to do with terrorism. And so far, what we're witnessing right now are a surge in those kind of technology, who are really designed to ensure social control. This has nothing to do with terrorism. Uh, last week, a bill was almost passed, until it was withdrawn, um, to put under surveillance all the beneficiary of social welfare in order to monitor their conversation, monitor the email, monitor uh, their phone call, uh, to make sure that they weren't cheating on social welfare. This has absolutely nothing to do with terrorism, and this bill almost got through something like one month after the, the, the this mass surveillance bill, who was supposed to be only on terrorism. So we're clearly witnessing that this bill, at least in France, has absolutely nothing to yet, do with terrorism. But then why do two-thirds of the French support? Because they don't realize the technical part of this. Uh, I think that 
now that this um, all, this bill on social welfare almost got through, uh, people are going to start and realize that uh, the head uh, the state is heading towards something very different. All right. So mass surveillance, not just to root out. Uh uh, a, a jihadist threat, but uh, to root out s uh, s uh, welfare cheats. Um, it's been all of this equipment and technology have, has been used for far wider uh, goals than were originally announced. Uh, I, I think it's really important that the American people understand this, and and also not just the American people, people of all, all countries who are also uh, undergoing a. Uh, uh, this kind of global surveillance, understand this, and, uh, you know, inquire and find out what's at the root of this. Uh, we not only have agencies, but we have contractors that share this information. And that's as damaging, if not more so, than the actual agencies. Uh, who wants contractors to have this kind of private information? Uh, we don't even we don't even have any surveillance over what they're doing. We don't have any. Uh, they operate under different laws than the agencies that that uh, that are U.S. agencies. So I think it's really important that that this all be brought out. That these things be. Uh, I, one of the things we're doing with my documentary that I'm directing and producing is we're talking to whistleblowers. We're talking to 30, 40 year veterans of NSA, CIA. And those are the people who know the information. Those are not politicians. Those are not people appointed as directors. These are the people who know the actual information, the technology, and what they need. That's who we need to listen to. All right, so different problems uh, when you're on either side of the Atlantic. Here in France, one of the big issues is that uh, the judges are understaffed, undermanned, and, over, under, and overwhelmed. Uh, in the United States, it's this whole business of outsourcing intelligence. Yeah, I, th I think it poses a real problem. I think we have to be really careful here is not to throw out the baby with the bathwater. We've talked about very specific instances where there's overreach or where there, there's a problem, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't have these measures. We're talking about a, a real threat that is very serious and that's imminent, and we can't deny the intelligence agencies having these tools be used appropriately. We just need to have the appropriate checks and balances in place to ensure that it doesn't, it doesn't get misused. And when it comes to giving up a bit of your privacy, to, uh, how, how much are you willing to give up? It seems as though everybody's got a different definition of the word privacy. I, I think you're quite right. It's, it's always a question of balance, and that's, and that's where the argument uh, needs to be. And we can't you know, simplify this argument to, well, the government can't have this. or the, gov the government needs this information. The real question is, what kind of constraints should be placed on it? What kind of oversight controls should there be? And right now, we have some controls that are pretty good in place. Perhaps we can improve them with some type of amendments, but it's still a necessary act. And that's the key message that people need that it needs to get home. Nathan Sales, what's your reaction to the debate that's happening here in France? Um, it's, uh, I'm, I'm uh, interested to hear uh, the claim that uh, the French are just now beginning to experiment with separation of powers. We, we in the United States actually look to Montesquieu and, uh, and French philosophes uh, for, for uh, inspiration when we designed our constitution 230 years ago. So um, I think we're all reading from the same page here. Um, uh, the United States has attracted a great deal of attention uh, as, as a result of the Snowden disclosures, but I, I think the debate that's going on in, in France right now was equally important um, because um, some very important differences between the United States approach and approaches taken by other countries is, is coming to the fore now. Um, in, in many other countries around the world, uh, it's possible to use intelligence techniques, including uh, mass surveillance, not just for the specific problem of securing the nation um, against external military and terroristic threats, but for a much broader range of reasons as well. Um, mass surveillance to protect the nation's economic interests, mass surveillance to protect the nation's industrial base. Um, those sorts of mass surveillance uh, initiatives are prohibited in the, in the United States. You can only collect information um, uh, under the NSA's metadata program or comparable programs to protect against uh, foreign threats to the national security. Um, so in, in this respect, I think the United States approach, though perhaps more controversial, actually compares very favorably to uh, much more permissive regimes that we see in other countries around the world. Fabrice Pelbon? Well, uh, sad but true, yeah. Uh, the, the French uh, position is far worse than uh, what the United States voted with the Patriot Act. Uh, we actually can use surveillance data for 
basically absolutely anything uh, from uh, IRS uh, investigation to um, social welfare, uh, cheating, to really, really anything. So we are heading to some very dark uh, era, and most of all, uh, we don't have the American Constitution. We have nothing like the First Amendment. We have nothing like the Fourth Amendment. So we don't have this legal protection, uh, and we don't have such a solid constitution. I mean, the American Constitution is really rock solid. You had it for 200 years. Uh, R is quite new. It's not even 70 years old, and it might change in a near future because it's kind of falling apart. Uh, so you say there's no Fourth Amendment. Just to remind viewers, the Fourth Amendment is, uh, is uh, uh, that uh, citizens can't be subjected to unreasonable searches and seizures uh, mm. on, on the part uh, of authorities. Nonetheless, you can win in courts if you do complain about it here. Again, the state, I doubt that very much, really. Uh, so far, I haven't heard about anybody winning against the state to, uh, because he was under surveillance for abusive reasons. All right. The, uh, uh, this is all, again, as we said at the outset, come to the fore because of Edward Snowden. He was then 29 years old, working as a subcontractor uh, for uh, the, uh, the, the NSA. And uh, from his exile in Russia, he's uh, often said that it was worth it, like in December of last year. I myself have lived in, ex in exile for more than a year and a half now. Uh, and these are things that are unlikely to change soon. But they're worth it. All the prices we've paid, all the sacrifices we've made, I believe we would do again. I know I would do it again. Because it was never about me. This was never about me, he or she. This is about us. This is about our rights. This is the kind of, about the kind of societies that we want to live in, the kind of government that we want to have, the kind of world that we want to make for the next generation. Jean-Pierre La Rochelle? I, 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 I share his sentiments. I, you know, I've, I've been on this program before and many times and have expressed a support for what Snowden did. What Snowden is talking about was programs and decisions that were made outside of public knowledge and outside of public approval process. Since his dissemination, there's been plenty of debate, and now we're having a discussion about what type of constraints need to be in place. So again, it's not, it's not the nature of the programs, it's the fact that it needs oversight, it needs constraints, and it's, it's a necessary tool. And I, I think even Snowden would agree with that. Nathan Sales, are you glad that Edward Snowden came along? I'm glad we're having the conversation, um, but I think there's a more responsible way to raise these issues than by violating your oath uh, of confidentiality. Um, the, the NSA metadata program uh, is justifiably controversial. Uh, it was adopted through secret interpretations of an obscure federal statute. Uh, we need to have a serious, open, transparent public debate about it. But many other things that uh, Mr. Snowden purported to blow the whistle on were vetted publicly. Uh, the the prison program, for instance, um, was authorized by Congress expressly uh, in 2007 as a temporary measure and then in 2008 as a permanent measure. Um, it was proposed after, in 2005 and 2006, the New York Times uh, released information about an NSA program uh, under the Bush administration. The United States spent years and years debating this. It's no secret that the NSA had a PRISM program because Congress expressly approved it um, and presidential candidates expressly debated it in 2008. Um, we don't gain anything by revealing the intricate details of that program that was publicly vetted uh, and congressionally approved. Um, right. If you're concerned about the choices that Congress made, your remedy is not to violate your oath. If you're concerned about the choices that Congress made in a transparent and public fashion, your remedy is to vote against them, which, by the way, is something you can't do in Vladimir Putin's Russia. Very briefly. Yeah. Um, basically, what Edward Snowden did and what a lot of other whistleblowers have done is 
defend the Constitution. That is the highest oath that they have. That is the highest oath that any senator or politician in America has. And that's what he did. And I'm proud of him for doing that. And I think this whole matter needs to be under a similar committee as Senator Frank Church had in the Church Committee during that CIA uh, time of abuse. We have a, a plethora of agencies now after 9-11, and no one knows what anyone is doing. Uh, we need a new Church Committee. All right. Need a, a, a new uh, t- a committee in the Senate to oversee all of it. Zachary Miller, I want to thank you. I want to thank uh, Nathan Sales for joining us from Syracuse, New York. I want to thank as well Jean-Pierre La Rochelle, Fabrice Pellebrun. Stay with us. Our Media Watch segment's next. All right. We're joined by uh, James Creeden. How are you, sir? Very well. Uh, thank you, Francois. So a lot uh, of discussion online about uh, the debate uh, topic this evening, and uh, certainly uh, it's dividing opinion in, in the U.S. Let's take a look at some of uh, the articles and reaction online. Um, Republicans are torching Rand Paul for letting the Patriot Act expire. I think that pretty much sums up a certain amount of the uh, opposition to uh, Rand Paul's uh, bid to see the certain elements of the Patriot Act expire. And uh, you can see on this tweet uh, uh, some elements of support for Rand uh, Paul in light of all of that criticism in the Republican Party and elsewhere. There is a hashtag stand with Rand. And here you have these are the people in John McCain's Nightmares. So John McCain, of course, more on the hawkish side of the Republican Party. And you can see there Rand Paul and others who were in favour of seeing elements of the Patriot Act expire. Uh, They are, I suppose, John McCain's worst nightmare. And indeed, uh, he would be the worst candidate we could put forward, uh, John McCain said of Rand Paul as a presidential candidate for 2016, pointing, some pointing out that John McCain indeed picked Sarah Palin as his vice president. So it depends on you know, your <laughs> political point of view. Chris Christie, the uh, New York, uh, New Jersey, rather, governor also of the Republican Party, says that uh, Rand Paul has sided with Edward Snowden. Of course, Edward Snowden, who um, un- uncovered or, or leaked the, the extent to which the National Security Agency was bulk uh, spying on the American public and indeed not just the American public. <laughs> and many have been saying really that... Uh, that this uh, the, uh, the, a ruling last week, indeed, which uh, which said that the NS- NSA bulk spying was illegal, which preceded uh, uh, the uh, the vote um, the vote. Uh, indeed, this this, that this is a vindication for mm. Edward Snowden. Uh, Glenn Greenwald, who was a journalist for the Guardian at the time, who helped um, Edward Snowden on on unveil all of that NSA spying, um, he has been active on social media as well, talking about this, saying the people warning of dangers from the Patriot Act lapse have been exploiting terror threats for many years and don't have any credibility. Um, So Rand Paul, I I think he is really the person we are seeing most discussion of on social media in relation to this and quotes from him, Francois, you can catch terrorists and have the Bill of Rights at the same time. So he has really been saying that if the legislation that already existed prior to 9-11 was properly used or exploited, there would be no need uh, to uh, extend it. And of course, the whole liberty versus security debate coming back here uh, quite extensively, many saying just get a warrant. That's all you need, really, uh, if you've used the uh, the existing legislation, you don't need mass surveillance. The New York Times, in fact, in its editorial, backing up uh, that point of view, saying let the Patriot Act provisions expire. Little by little, we've allowed our freedom to slip away Um, And they said, uh, or that that was actually a quote from Rand Paul, the government has not offered persuasive evidence that bulk collection of phone records has been crucial to foiling terrorist plots. Uh, I want to ask Zachary Miller about this. A bit of an unholy alliance, isn't there, between libertarians on the one side and progressive Democrats. You're a member of Democrats abroad here in Paris. Uh, uh, What does it feel like to be on the same side of the argument as Rand Paul? Well, see, this is one of those rare, rare uh, occasions where uh, there are Democrats and Republicans together on both sides of the issue. That almost never happens. And as you know, I supported uh, President Obama. I ran his campaign here uh, both terms, uh, you know, both elections. Uh, but I disagree with him on this. And I think the candidate Obama would disagree with him on this. James Green. All right. Well, uh, a lot of people disagreeing with Ron Paul for, for more ex- within the Republican Party, saying that this is the most dangerous time since 9-11. That is a, a quote from former New York Governor George Pataki. Uh, others, uh, these are, of course, presidential hopefuls as well for 2016 ah, within the Republican that's Party. An, that's an important point. It <laughs> might indeed be. Uh, Lindsey Graham as well saying that, uh, simply put, radical Islam is running wild. So a lot of people saying really that rolling back NSA uh, um 
potential for surveillance is just dangerous for uh, American security. I'll just show you a couple of tweets of people making fun of those, some would say perhaps fear mongerers. I hope you're happy now that portions of the Patriot Act have expired. This is what your Barbies will look like. So uh, <laughs> that's one point of view. And another saying, uh, that's actually, this is actually the same Twitter user, at uh, Libya Liberty. Soon, you, soon this will be all American cats. Don't say Fox News didn't warn you. And that's a, 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 Quran, a Quran reading uh, American cat, Francois. Not sure how that's relevant to the debate this evening, but some think, some think it is. Okay. <laughs> all right, many thanks uh, for that, James Creed. And I want to thank our panel once again. Thank you for joining us here in the France 24 debate.